Thank you, Dr. Agrawal. I am Dr. Anjali Bhatt from Pune, co-scientific chair of International Diabetes Expert Conclave 2020. I hope you enjoyed the first lecture and here we are with the uh, second lecture by Dr. Vivian Fonseca. I do have this privilege to introduce him as a professor of medicine, assistant dean for clinical research, the Tulin Tulin Alumni Chair in Diabetes and chief of the section of endocrinology, Tulin University Medical Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. Over to you, Dr. Fonseca, for a clinically very relevant topic of uh, overcoming the limitations of HbA1c in clinical practice. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the organizers of this meeting. I think it's really spectacular that we're having a global meeting uh, in the midst of uh, a global epidemic. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something that we all take for granted. Hemoglobin A1C, we all do the test. We all know the limitations. You know, we were told you'll get false results in people with renal disease and people with anemia, et cetera. Yet we, do, we keep doing it and get, when we get the result we don't like, we say, well, it's probably false because uh, of this reason or that reason. So I'm not going to go into that aspect. I want to look at hemoglobin A1C for, in a different light. There are some additional features about hemoglobin A1C that are not widely recognized that point to some very important fundamental Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Fonseca. Uh, we are not able yeah. to see your slides. If you can share your slides also. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter, but I'm not seeing, okay. That was the first introductory slide, so you didn't really miss anything. So let me yeah. now go to... So let, can we find a better test than hemoglobin A1C? Uh, and the question then comes up, what do we want a better test for? Do you want it to assess glycemic control? And I'll discuss some alternatives later on. Metabolic control, which is a little bit more than just glucose. Uh, can hemoglobin A1C tell us something a little bit more? I'm not going to go into diabetes diagnosis for lack of time, but I uh, will keep coming up to the issue of risk of complications. Uh, one of the best things about A1C since it's uh, since we started using it was not just uh, does it tell us about the previous three months of glycemic control, but it also is a very good prognostic marker uh, to uh, tell us what the risk of complications are in the long Dr. term. Dr. Fonseca, and we still don't see your slide. Yeah, I am sharing it. Can you stop and start again? Okay. Can you see the slides now? No. No, sir. Can you see? No. Uh, it says you are sharing Microsoft PowerPoint. I'll uh, on the past section. Kevin, can you uh, stop and start again, or do you want us to start at our end and uh, display the slides? Do that. Uh, oh, you know, I change from the uh, back. Uh, you know, then I won't be able to see. I may not be able to see you. Uh, just, just tell me what you what you want. So I'm doing share screen. And go to PowerPoint out there. When you share screen, go to PowerPoint. That's what I did. And it says you are sharing Microsoft PowerPoint. We can see a blank slide, but we're not able to see the content. Okay, please, please stop sharing. I will share your slides. You can prompt me next slide. Please stop okay. sharing. But I need to see what I what it is. Yeah, you'll be able to see you it. You would be able to see it. You see it, sir? Vivian, can no, you see the slide? No. Come to the blue jean screen, sir. Bring up the blue jean screen. Okay, I can see the slide now. Yeah, please prompt can me you next move slide. It? Next slide. 
Okay, go through the animation. I've already talked about this, so let's move ahead. Okay, so what is A1C? It is basically uh, a glucose that is bound to I'm sharing the components slide for of. Him. Pardon? Please it is continue, glucose. Dr. Fonseca. We are able to see you and hear okay. you properly. Please go ahead. So it is uh, glucose bound to components of the uh, hemoglobin molecule. There's a component that is very rapid. Next slide. Just. And there's a stable component which reflects more advanced uh, 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 glycation uh, of the hemoglobin molecule. So there are two components, and you see that sometimes that uh, in some people, particularly with very high A1Cs, when you start improving control, there's a rapid decline in, in A1C, whereas the stable component takes much longer. Next slide. Next slide. Next. Okay, so, and there are multiple ways for measuring this. Next. Uh, I'll skip over this methodology thing. There are, depends on what kind of method you're using to measure A1C, and that can vary a lot as well. Next slide. Uh, let's skip over this one. Okay, so uh, in the diabetes control and complications trial, we, I mean, this is where uh, A1C really came into its prime. We noted a very clear separation in A1C between the two groups. There was a separation in glucose, but it was less stable. You see the stability of A1C over time. Next slide. Next, but really the, the uh, prevention of complications was what really mattered. Let, but we also realized that there was a lot of variation uh, in A1C. So standardization was another thing that came into being, and at least in the United States, all A1C is standardized. This is not really done to the same standard across the world, and that may be something you need to keep in mind in practice. Next. There's a lot of inter-lab variation, and the results can vary from lab to lab and clinic to clinic, and uh, you should encourage regional standardization. Next slide. Another effort that came from the ADA was actually to try and uh, teach people about A1C and relate it to blood glucose. So uh, next, they did a study which showed a relationship between the two and allowed us to estimate average glucose based on the A1C so we could tell patients when we did an A1C what their average glucose was likely to be. And this led to a lot of confusion because people didn't quite relate that. When they tested at home, they got different results and that was a, a bit of a problem. Plus, there are other issues with this relationship that I'm going to discuss. Next slide. So here is a study looking at this relationship between uh, twins with diabetes and without diabetes, and you see a very clear relationship uh, uh, when, uh, between uh, monozygotic twins. So something about A1C runs in families whether you have diabetes or not. Next slide. There's a, a fair amount of variation in uh, bi biological variation between subjects with the same degree of, of glycemia. There's also regional variation and variability, which is another important topic that I don't have time to go into. But is you'll see some things in the literature now that suggest that people who have glycemic A1C variation uh, tend to have more complications of diabetes. And that might reflect uh, either intermittent compliance with therapy uh, or some other factor that's important, and that might include changes in inflammation and uh, uh, other factors that determine hemoglobin glycation. Next slide. Next. So one thing that struck us here in New Orleans several years ago was the ethnic differences. So you see here the mean blood glucose, uh, and we compared Caucasians with uh, uh, with uh, African Americans, and you see for the same level of glucose consistently in different age groups, A1C is higher 
than in cocaine in blacks compared to, to whites. And this is a fairly consistent finding. And uh, it, it, this has been noted in other studies as well. It has led to difficulties <clears throat> in interpreting A1C in, in some ethnic groups, as well as in the diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, and this was also noted uh, in the diabetes prevention program. Next. Next. So we started looking more and more into this relationship between A1C and hemoglobin A1C and, and, and fasting plasma glucose. And while we plot these regression lines and you see that there is a significant, statistically significant correlation, you see a lot of variation. You'll see that some people have an A1C of 10 to 12, despite their fasting glucose being less than 200. There are very few, but there's still some who are above the line. That means their A1C is higher than what you would predict. And there are some who are below the line. Uh, next slide. This is taken from NHANES, which represents the, the uh, average US population. And we see that this uh, uh, across the board in diabetics and in non-diabetics, blacks have a higher HG, uh, HGI, which is hemoglobin glycation index, which I will discuss in more detail. But that what it means is that the A1C is higher than what you would expect based on their fasting as well as mean blood glucose. Next slide. So we felt that this relationship between mean blood glucose and A1C that many people had put out there that A1C represents average glucose over three months is actually next. It's really not true. Next slide. Next. And that there is a variation in different people. And we started doing a number of studies looking at this. Uh, here is data from seven point profiles, not just fasting glucose. We've used seven point profiles in a group of children as well as in the DCCT group. And you see again the same relationship. The regression line looks very nice and you have a good correlation, but some people are mm -hmm. above the line having in a higher A1C than you expect and some are below the line. Next. So we did a study in the local children's hospital. My colleague Jim Hempy has been a big uh, mover of this concept, and he did repeated visits in 128 patients looking at this relationship. Next. And what he found is that there are three populations. Some are very close, have a very close relationship, what you would expect. And there are some people where the uh, A1C is higher and some where it is lower. Next. And he came to the conclusion that A1C was influenced by our factors other than glucose. But my, another way to look at it is that it's defected by glycation of that hemoglobin. Remember the first slide that I told you. Some people glycate more than others. Next. So here's the concept that uh, evolved, and from mainly Jim Hempy's uh, concept. He predicted A1C based on the mean blood glucose, and we observed the A1C. So observed minus predicted gave you what he called the hemoglobin glycation index. So if you had an observed A1C that was much higher than predicted, you had a high hemoglobin glycation index, which indicated you were glycating at a greater rate. Next slide. Next. So this is HGI zero uh, is the predicted line, and you see people who have high HGI and low HGI above and below the line. Next. So the question we asked is, do people who have a high HGI have more complications since they are glycating proteins more? And that's one of the fundamental pathophysiological abnormalities in diabetes. So we looked at the uh, a DCCT population, we started off with a small group of patients and looked at their A1C relationship with blood glucose over time, next, and uh, derived the, the equation for that population and then applied it to the whole population, next. And we see, you see, here's the distribution. You see some people have high hemoglobin uh, glycation and others have a low one, next. 
So here is a hypothesis, uh, more or less proven. We found that in the DCCT trial, at least, although A1C in general predicted retinopathy and nephropathy, even among those uh, DCCT population and looking at A1C, those with a high HGI, uh, what I mean is a higher A1C than you would predict for the blood glucose based on seven-point glucose profiles, they had more nephropathy and more retinopathy. And that's very clearly seen on this slide. Next. Next. So we started looking at this in other populations and calculating this in, in a, looking at continuous glucose monitoring. Some people said, well, this reflects postprandial glucose. And we found that this has nothing to do with the postprandial glucose. It, it, you can use the fasting glucose for the equation, or you can use CGM, uh, uh, and, and you still see the same relationship. Some people have a higher A1C than you would expect. Next. Next. And it's consistent. We keep repeating it, and you keep seeing that. And so this is not an artifact of blood glucose measurement bias. Next. I'll skip this one. Let's move on. This was found by other people as well, looking at different methods of A1C measurement. Next. Around this time, other people started looking at other measures and looked at the relationship of fructosamine and A1C, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail. And year two, you see a discrepancy. Some people have very good correlations, and some people are off the line. Next. So uh, Bob Cohen and others, next, keep clicking. Uh, showed, uh, you know, just as we had observed a higher a A1C for a level of glucose, they noticed higher other plasma proteins, whether it's albumin or fructosamine. There's some people who are higher than expected, and the term they used is glycation gap. Next. Next slide. So glycation gap reflects the discordance between A1C for a given glucose and fructosamine for a given glucose. And Bob Cohen and his group proposed that this glycation gap was also a predictor of complications, and in this case, it's nephropathy. And this has been tested in, in uh, data from DCCT and other trials. Next slide. Next. Next. So we, we started looking at this uh, uh, equation in other populations, trying to develop population-based regression lines between glucose and A1C and identify uh, hemoglobin gl uh, glycation index, which I think is very much a su uh, surrogate for this other thing of uh, glycation gap. Next slide. Next. So we wanted to apply to another population, and we this time chose the ACCORD study. Uh, and uh, uh, you know the ACCORD study well, so let's skip through the next two, three slides in the interest of time. Uh, you, you looked at the glycemia arm. You know that uh, mortality was increased. The primary outcome was not changed, and there was the intensive group had this higher mortality. Next slide. But still, A1C predicted mortality, whether in the intensive or the standard group. And another thing that was noticed was a very high rate of severe hypoglycemia in the intensive treatment group. Next slide. We tried to look at reasons for hypoglycemia. This was done by the, DC, by the ACCORD study group initially, and they found that people with nephropathy, uh, older people, and African Americans tended to have more hypoglycemia than others. And we were puzzled by these things and wondered why. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. It didn't matter which, whether you were in the intensive or standard group. Next. If you had more hypoglycemia, you had higher mortality. Uh, this occurred even in the standard group. Next, the higher the A1C, the higher the mortality, whether you were the intensive or standard group, as well as if you had more hypoglycemia, you had a higher mortality. Next. Next. Let, next. So we examined the ACCORD study group, and uh, John Buse was also part of this uh, uh, 
sub-study of Accord. We looked at HGI, and we found that year two, there was a high HGI group and a low HGI group. And after treatment, uh, both A1C fell in the intensive treatment group, but the groups remained the same. If you had a high HGI at, at baseline and you were randomized to standard group, you got to where the standard group needed to be, you still had a high HGI. And if you were in the intensive group, you still had an HG, higher HGI. But realize one thing, if you are in the intensive treatment group and you have a high HGI and you're targeting based on A1C, your A1C, if it goes down near 6%, is falsely high and you have a very low blood glucose. And the consequence of that was more hypoglycemia. And lo and behold, we pr uh, predicted that and that's exactly what happened. Uh, there was a uh, much higher rate of hypoglycemia in both the intensive and the standard treatment group in those who had a high HGI. Next slide. Uh, we predicted not hypoglycemia you see at the bottom uh, 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 line. The In red there is those who have a high HGI in the intensive treatment group. Uh, and this is the Kaplan-Meier being free from hypoglycemia. And interestingly, it also predicted the primary outcome of ca cardiovascular MACE, as well as total mortality. So high HGI indicated a higher risk of hypoglycemia if you're doing intensive therapy, but it also predicted mortality. And we uh, wonder whether this is linked to some fundamental things that also predict uh, HGI. Next slide. Uh, let's skip over this. It's saying the same thing, that you have more mortality and more hypoglycemia. If you look at the hypoglycemia rate in the high HGI group, it's much higher, 1.44, compared to the low HGI group, which is 0.9. Next slide. So we have been doing some GWAS studies, the genome-wide association uh, uh, scanning, and we are finding a few genes that are linked with this high HGI in the ACCORD study. Uh, year are three, the TXN and COL, and a couple of others, and well, next slide. So we try to uh, look at what are these things. So one of them is a thing called thioredoxin reductase, which is a critical and antioxidant defense signaling. And uh, uh, it wasn't hugely significant, but it does suggest that maybe oxidative stress is a potential mechanism, and some people have more oxidative stress, they tend to have a higher HGI. Next slide. Uh, here is a list of genes, and I'm not going to go, go into them. These are ones that have been identified as being uh, possibly associated with a high, could affect HGI in different ways. Some could make it higher, some could make it lower. Next slide. Now we need to, this is in one population and we need to validate it and we are currently looking at this in the uh, ARIC study. Uh, but we've also looked at other things that might be driving this high uh, HGI. So we, here we look at uh, fasting glucose and, A1C, uh, and A1C and then calculate A HGI in a variety of different populations. Here's the uh, enhanced population. And what you find in black that those who have a high HGI tend to have a higher C-reactive protein and a higher monocyte count. So not only is a high HGI associated with a higher A1C, but you're also getting more inflammation, and as I pointed out earlier, more oxidative stress, all of which may be contributing to your higher risk of complications of diabetes. Next slide. Uh, Next, this is the same thing in more detail. Next slide. So uh, I, 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 let's let's skip this and move over to alternatives. What else uh, can can we? Uh, one other thing is uh, obesity. So obesity also might drive a, a higher uh, level of HGI and might contribute to worsening uh, prognosis. Next slide. Next. So I want to spend a little time talking about alternatives. We, I mentioned fructosamine. I want to mention one that has now recently become available in the United States, and we've done some, some work, and I'll show you some data on it. And this is glycated albumin. This is a specific measurement related to uh, glycation of albumin and is not dependent on things like anemia. Uh, 
It's different from fructosamine, and I'll show you that in a moment. And uh, I'll show you what happens in the short term when, when you change glycemia. Next slide. So glycated albumin, as I said, is specific. It is only glycated albumin, whereas fructosamine is a wide range of proteins. There are globulins, there are al there's albumin in there. So a component of fructosamine is actually glycated albumin. And they, because of the globulins and other proteins, there are many things like infections, et cetera, that can change it. And that's a problem that we, you note in clinical practice. Next slide. Next. So here is our first study that we did over four weeks. We took people, this is a small group of people, and we uh, ra random, uh, we treated them uh, with intensive treatment. So usually they got either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or uh, 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 started insulin therapy. And in the blue squares, you see the A1C. It comes down, but it took 12 weeks to uh, see a reduction. Whereas in contrast, uh, this is in percent reduction from baseline, you see that mean blood glucose comes down very fast. This is on CGM. And in the, in the uh, blue diamonds, you see the glycosylated albumin. We came down in four weeks, uh, and it predicted the A1C change in three months uh, extremely well. Fructosamine, on the other hand, came down uh, along with glycated albumin and then rose for reasons we don't understand. There was a bit of fluctuation. And uh, uh, Glycated albumin correlated very well with continuous glucose monitoring, including the fluctuation that you see in some patients a few weeks after changing therapy. So this was preliminary data. We felt that this was a good predictor of short-term change, as well as predicting uh, uh, A1C change over a long period of time. Next slide. We have now completed and recently published in JCEM a, a longer-term study in people who were changing their therapy. And you see here what I pointed out earlier, the A1C takes some time to change. Seven-day mean blood glucose drops quickly and then tends to go up if you don't maintain persistence of intensifying therapy. Glycated albumin predicted uh, long-term change over six months in, in A1C. And I think that's very useful in a different way. If you do glycated albumin in two to four weeks on a new therapy, you can see that it's working and you can predict what will happen with the A1C over time, whereas you cannot predict that uh, very well unless you do CGM. And, and that's expensive and complex. So a simple test can predict what will happen uh, with the uh, A1C. Fructosamine, you see the fluctuation, and I'll show you another. Uh, next slide. You see the fluctuation in the lower, uh, uh, lower panel. I, we don't understand why in some people fluctu uh, fructosamine tends to go up and down a lot, whereas glycated albumin is, is a lot more stable and correlates very well with seven-day mean glucose, as well as CGM in those who had CGM. Next slide. So in general, in terms of predicting A1C, glycated albumin was better than fructosamine. And uh, here are some uh, ranking of, of the correlations uh, that, in general, 56% of patients did had a better prediction with glycated albumin than with fructosamine. Next slide. So in summary, A1C is a very good test for glycemic control and predicts complications. But it has several limitations. Some of those we've recognized for a long time some of those, like the glycation gap and hemoglobin glycation index, are, are less well recognized, but they help us refine outcome prediction. Our data suggests that this is an inherited trait. Uh, it is uh, it not only is inherited, you can make it worse with things like obesity and if you're exposed to oxidative stress and, and inflammation, as some populations are. And we have to think about alternatives, such as glycated albumin, fructosamine, and continuous glucose monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian, for your fantastic lecture and a lot of new thoughts about it. I'm impressed about uh, talking about AGI. I feel whether the AGI that you see in the different people, is it because of the difference in the hemoglobin? Like, for example, the black population there are a lot of differences in the hemoglobin structure, like hemoglobin F, hemoglobin S, and the... We excluded people with those. We excluded, excluded people it. with those. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. The next question, there's a, one question has come from the northern part of India. Can we use hemoglobin A1C to diagnose GDM? Well, the thing is that GDM is changing so fast and a hemoglobin A1C is a lot slower. Much of the data with GDM and outcomes is based on glucose tolerance test and not A1C change. As you saw from our graph, you get a change in glucose, it will take you three months to see a change that's, that's significant, particularly at the lower end of normal uh, or the upper end of normal, the women who are just becoming diabetic. It takes a while for the A1C to change. And, and I, I don't think you should be using A1C. You should be doing the following the recommendations uh, about glucose tolerance testing. Anjali, you have any questions? Yeah, uh, wonderful presentation, sir. This is uh, something which I have been wanting to hear for a long time, that when we are trying to use um, these tools for diagnosing or evaluating the glycemic control of our patients, we tend to replace one with other and what we need, what, what we have been doing is that in the initial period DCCT times we saw thought that A1C is probably the better predictor of complications compared to glucose. And now what we know is that it's not just an average estimate of glucose, but it is the way the glycation happens that is predicting the complications, right? You have summed, so you have summed up my talk so well, I should have, you, you could have given it. <laughs> So, so, so what do we mean by this is that the HbA1c can be predictor of complication only if a person is high glycating index. And in yes. others, it is better to con manage the glucose level rather than, unless we have something better than that, isn't it? Well, and, you're, and hearing, you're hearing a lot of talk about this when people talk about time and range on CGM, that they, particularly right. in type 1. But really what you're talking about here, time and range cannot give you a full prediction of what's going to happen in the long term. It, there, there just is not enough data. So we want to know whether you have either a genetic or some other reason, for some other reason, a susceptibility of glycation of your proteins. We all accept that Absolutely. protein glycation is a fundamental abnormality that drives complications of diabetes. And here you have a way to assess your risk of glycation. Right. I, I do so want to point talk? out, though, that this varies a lot within the population that you study. It goes, H, hemoglobin glycation goes up with age. It goes up with obesity, as you saw. You need to define it in the population that you are looking at. So don't use our equation, which is based on NHANES and Accord, in an Indian population. You will have to de derive for your own local population your own formula to derive HGI. Absolutely. From your presentation, correct me if I'm wrong, people with, who tend to have more hypoglycemia do have higher high, uh, glycation index, is that correct? Well, what it is is that if your HGI is high and you have a falsely high, I won't use the, shouldn't use the term, say falsely, you have an A1C that's high and you're targeting say 7% or 6.5, whatever you want to target, the glucose value will be lower. So you will be using more insulin and therefore you're going to get more hypoglycemia. That is what I think as a simplistic view. There may be some other reason right. that I don't understand. Right, but in no question. hypoglycemia. Right. No question. They say that yes, uh, the Europeans are using more of the SI index to define the A1C, whereas the USA and India, we still use percentage. Isn't the advantage in using the SI, uh, SI kind of a, index to calculate the A1C? Is it any different uh, or it no, any sense? No, it, it, it's a straight thing. It's like it, it, grams and kilograms, I mean pounds and kilograms. It's a straight conversion in that respect. It has nothing to do with HGI. Uh, we Why are a little old-fashioned in America. We are trying to make it great again, but uh, you know, it's, that's the way it is. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we use the, uh, the old units still. There's one more question, methodology of investigation. I, I think the time is up, sir. The bell rang. Okay, we okay, don't... you can go ahead with the question. Yeah, yeah, we can, I think we can. Last question for you, sir, last question, which is, it appears very, depends on the methodology adopted to estimate the A1C. It is said that if you use the charge method of estimation A1C versus the structural change of estimation A1C, what could be the difference between these two? 
the what is uh, the acceptable difference with the charge method versus the structural change in the events hemoglobin uh, i i i you know quite honestly i don't know enough about the the that aspect to to truly answer the question so long as you're consistent in your methodology it, it, that's what i prefer so uh, i in the us uh, the dcct lab which is in the university of missouri is runs the standardization for every lab they have to send a sample and standardize against what the methodology used by university of missouri at least once a year or every other year so you have a standardized methodology. You will still see some variations lab to lab. And that is another important message that I think I want to give people. Use the same lab in the same patient consistently. Otherwise, you will get a variation, sometimes of 0.2 to 0.4%, which is quite a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your excellent talk. We really enjoyed it and learned quite a bit from you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to the organizers for the next session. Thank you so much.